Okay. And please, please, please mute your mics. That is probably the number one comment we get from other people is that people are not kind. They don't mute their mics. And then we hear background noise um, and, and things that disrupt the meeting. So please, please mute your mics and be respectful to the other, uh, what is there on this call now? Other 192 participants on, on, on the call. Uh, one other thing on that, Dennis, if I see that somebody's mic is not, is not muted, I will send you a chat asking you to mute your mic. So if you're not aware that you're not muted, you may want to check the chat box. Because somebody is definitely not muted. Thank you. OK, cool. Well, then we will go ahead and move through and start on this uh, advanced training topic. Uh, we're going to do a two-parter. We, we've got part one today which is kind of on, uh, on knowing your weeds. So we're gonna do a little back, background work on weeds, uh, the classification, those type of things. And then in, in two weeks on Thursday, I can't remember the date, the 18th I believe comes to mind, we're gonna get into control measures. So today we're not gonna really talk about so much control, but I know that's the answer everyone's gonna want, but uh, we're gonna kind of do this, this is a two-parter here today. So we're going to um, go ahead and move into this section called Knowing Your Weeds. So we're gonna start in with what is the definition of a weed. And uh, so I went to the old um, Webster's Dictionary for that information. And uh, so a weed is a plant that is not valued where it is growing. Um, it's usually a fairly vigorous plant, uh, one that chokes out more desirable plants. Uh, it's a, a weedy growth of a plant. Uh, of course, there's aquatic weeds. Of course, there's the good old marijuana uh, definition of, of a weed um, in there. Uh, it can also extend to, uh, you know, in this definition to a, uh, a, a person. Um, to um, our thing. And uh, then, of course, it also has references uh, to, to animals, um, those type of things also. So in a layman's term, what, what is a weed? A weed is a, a plant out of place. It's, it's unwanted growth. Uh, we consider it uh, potentially harmful, um, objectionable. Um, it can be a invasive a plant. Um, and it can also be what we consider a garden thug. Hey, Karen, can I ask you a question? Can you tell if we're recording? Because my little um, record button is not showing up. Mine is not either. Let me try it. I don't know if you can do it. It says, please request recording permission from the host. Yeah, that would be me. Um, oh, dear. Let me, uh, let, let me try something here. Because usually I had a little button showing up that says I was recording. Oh, I hope it is recording. Miles, Miles Raymond says that he sees. It's recording. Yeah, people say that they do see it. Yep, I just couldn't see it. So I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. So as I was saying, um, a layman's is this plant out of place and, and that's pretty much the the gardener definition so I, I want to say that that plant out of place extends to plants that we might consider desirable plants I, I guess my comment there is just because you have a plant that's that's growing and it needs to be divided so a good example would be you divide a daylily and you get a half a dozen starts out of the daylily plant that doesn't mean you need to plant a half a dozen daylilies throughout your yard um, that would become a weed. You only need one or two clumps, the rest of it could be thrown away. And I know that's hard for gardeners to do that, to um, discard, throw away a plant, but sometimes uh, enough's enough. And you, need to throw, you know, discard or give away those other desirable plants. Um, so anyway, uh, a weed's a plant out of place. It's unwanted growth. Uh, it's harmful objectionable habits. It's invasive. And it can be what we call a garden thug. And I'll, I'll define that thug here uh, in a second. So that's kind of 
goes without saying. So what really makes a plant a weed? You think of those that are truly weeds um, as they have a really long life in the soil. Uh, those seeds can lay dormant for years, decades, and then when they're disturbed, usually most weed seeds germinate in a response to sunlight. So that's why when you cultivate uh, a soil and you think, wow, it's all weed free, you come back a week, 10 days later and weeds are back there. That's because as you undermine, cut that soil, um, that it's uh, now uh, exposed those weed seeds to sunlight and now you're getting um, germination again. And one way to, to fix, kind of fix that or reduce that problem when you're tilling the soil is not to deeply till the soil. All you're doing is controlling the weeds. When you hoe, you don't really want a chopping action in the soil. You just want to glide, like just right under the soil surface, just severing those root systems. Because if you start chopping, that's when you expose that soil to more weeds and more weeds. So that's why you hoe, you weed, you hoe, you weed, because you're, you're disturbing that soil. Uh, a lot of weeds also have a fairly short um, germination period. Um, you know, they can, they can establish right quickly, uh, very rapidly grow, which makes them more hard to eradicate. Um, we don't have any special requirements for germination. You look at a lot of our desirable plants and they have to go through what they call stratification or scarification. Uh, stratification, uh, we think about cold treatment. So like the plant has to go through so many hours of chilling before it germinates because it has a, a dormancy requirement or scarification is where the seed actually has to pass through an animal where the seed coat has to be broken down before moisture can get into that seed and, and it can start to germinate. Most weed seeds, they just pop right out. Uh, and then of course, it has ability to survive uh, under and prosper under many different conditions and uh, even sometimes being disturbed, uh, they, they still can come back. Uh, so weeds just have this, you know, resilience. Uh, so they're, they're more uncontrollable. Uh, there's uh, so many of them, they're, they're uh, where they become then a problem in, in our landscape or in our gardens. So, you know, it kind of goes without saying why weeds? Well, because they, they thrive in many different conditions, you know, anywhere from wet to dry to, to cold to hot. Um, as I said, they reseed freely. Uh, many of them have very extensive underground root systems. Uh, we'll talk about bindweed here in a little bit, nutgrass, those type of things. Uh, some of them have really good dispersal methods. Uh, a couple we'll talk about, you know, have little spiny appendages that attach to the fur of animals that we traveled. Um, you know, a lot of them like dandelions blow in the wind. Uh, we'll talk about hairy crabweed. When they explode their seeds, they can travel four feet or more. Uh, so bottom line is weeds are just opportunistic. Um, you know, kind of the old give a, as I kind of said in the report, give, give a weed an inch and it'll take a yard. Kind of that philosophy uh, to them. And then unfortunately, uh, what I call a garden thug. Um, to me, a garden thug is a garden plant that we planted with good intentions, but it, it just does not behave well. It's one of those plants that I would call uncontrollable. Um, and my difference between a thug and an invasive plant, and we'll talk about some invasives at the very end, a garden thug pretty much stays put in your garden, where what I would call an invasive plant, that's the one that's reseeded out into our native woodland, our rangeland, cropland, uh, that's taking over the natural uh, habitat. Where a garden thug is something that stays, for the more, more or less, there's one on, well, not on this list, that sometimes you, you, you plan it, you can't get rid of it. So mint would be a great uh, example of that. Uh, I think everyone knows it's spreading habit. Uh, garlic chives has a white flower on it, but it produces a little black seed and reseeds freely everywhere. Um, I take a lot of heat for putting northern sea oats on this list, but I've had personal bad experience with both garlic chives and northern sea oats I have on this list. If you've been in this building, uh, northern sea oats has expanded well beyond where it was originally planted over the 15, 16 years. Uh, it recedes freely. Uh, the chameleon plant, you know, there's a picture of it there. You know, this thing will grow through uh, kind of like bamboo, will grow through asphalt. 
And then there's the goose neck loosestrife, which is the white plant, it, it spreads. You know, some of these you may argue with. Monarda, uh, if you can control Monarda, keep it in balance, it, it's probably a desirable plant, same way for the obedient plant. But you know, out here in the garden gallery, we put a, a little plant of Monarda in last year, you know, that was in a little, you know, six inch pot. And probably this year, it had spread probably to a good two plus foot circle of, of plant material. And if that was not left under control, it would quickly take over a garden. So Karen, I think I'm gonna stop there. I saw there was eight or nine comments pop up. Are there any things that we need to address at this point? Uh, the only two that would be for you um, would be, well, let me, let me just say one thing right now though. I am trying to text all of the people who are not muted. So if you can please mute your mics, we're still getting quite a bit of feedback. And um, I hope you don't take offense that I am texting you if I see your name on the screen not muted. It's a, it's a friendly text. Okay, um, the things for you, I'm gonna read you a list. Uh, Rosa Sharon, Ruella Native Petunia, Primrose, Ajuga, and Horseradish. Yeah, so you're going back to this list of garden thugs. Um, so, you know, I kind of put, my, well, my, this is my own personal garden philosophy, and I know several have heard me say this before, when it comes to my perennial garden, I jokingly tell people, if it spreads faster, then I can keep it in bounds, it's out of my garden. So I don't have time to go out there in the spring and take that clump of Monarda back to six inches. So I don't plant it. Um, horseradish, you know, yeah, you got to where it goes because you're probably not getting rid of that. A juga, you know, I have a juga in my garden. I, I can control that back. I can undercut the root system and get rid of it. Um, but yeah, you can't let it get away from it. Um, let's see. Uh, what was the other ones, Karen, you named? Uh, let's see. Common milkweed. Common milkweed, yeah. Japanese that one anemone. Is. Yep. And I think that's it. Okay. Yeah, hey, there's hey. more. I think when it comes to this list of garden thugs, I think we're all going to have our personal hot buttons, <laughs> so to yes. speak, those that we, we can tolerate, those we can't tolerate. Um, and... Uh, so I, this would be your own list, but th this is kind of my, my list, but I think you guys added some other nice ones to that list also. Okay. Anything else, Karen? Uh, no, thank you. Okay, you're doing a great job, appreciate it. Okay, so we're gonna move now into what I'm gonna call a basic botany lesson. So this is going back to um, our basic uh, master gardener training. Uh, but I think we review from time to time. Um, on, on the um, lessons. So we're gonna start first about an annual plant. An annual plant, a true annual plant, completes its life cycle in one growing season. Now a growing season may not be, you know, spring to fall. A growing season could be fall to summer. So we have what we call summer annuals and winter annuals. So uh, we put a lot of plants in the annual category, but botanically they're not. So a good example would be the, the annual lantana. Uh, we think of that as an annual plant in Kansas City, but if we were in um, Dallas, Texas, my son goes to college in Denton, Texas, and um, lantana is a three by three shrub down there. So it's a perennial plant, but it's killed by a frost, so we think of it an annual. But a true annual, it grows, sets flower, develops a seed and dies. There's no way to keep it alive. Uh, so on these uh, summer annual weeds, these germinate more in the spring, uh, flower and then die at the end of the season. Usually a frost kills them off or they're gonna die naturally. So crabgrass would be a great example of that in our climate. Uh, or we have the, the fall germinating ones like uh, henbit. Uh, in the fall henbit, you know, that purple flowering one is this little small, maybe the size of a dime to a quarter a uh, little rosette, we call it, and then it overwinters, and then it bursts into flower come spring. And, and this botany lesson is important is because it gets back into control. 
it gets back into the time of control because any plant weeds are easiest to control when they're young, just developing, as opposed to when they're setting seed and flower. So this explains why we have control times different depending on whether it's a annual, a perennial, uh, whether it's a summer annual weed or a winter annual weed. Um, this is what gets back to knowing when is the proper time to put down control. And then we have a, a true biennial, which uh, takes two seasons to produce a bloom. So that first season, it's just vegetative. Usually here again, just a little color rosette, which is just sometimes a little cluster of leaves hugging the ground. And then the second year, it sends out a flower stalk and the seeds, and then that plant dies, but it reseeds itself. So we kind of think of it more as a perennial because it's perennialized in our garden always that same plant that comes back. That plant moves in part to, uh, place to place. And probably the classic one around here, and it's just now coming to flower, is musk thistle. Uh, this is a nasty, nasty, noxious weed in the state of Kansas throughout the Midwest. Uh, in fact, I sat at my cube window, and there's one right outside my window of this office building. Um, and these then uh, choke out our native vegetation, pasture land, crop range land, and uh, are just, just a nasty, nasty weed. And so being biennial, once it gets into flower, outside of cutting off those flower stalks, there's absolutely no control you're gonna have of this plant. It's really gotta be in that first season of that vegetative growth when it comes to a biennial plant, but we don't notice it until it comes into flower. Then of course, a perennial plant is uh, more than three seasons. Uh, some people say more than two, and that could also be in the definition. You know, it was just two and died, that'd make it a biennial. But it lived, if it lived more than just one year, two years, three years, then that would be what we consider a perennial. So they, a lot of perennials reseed themselves, and they also then have the aggressive root system that makes them also very difficult to control with runners and rhizomes. So, you know, dandelions, they reseed themselves freely, Creeping Charlie, ground ivy, the other photo there, there. Um, vegetative parts is what keeps that plant coming back year to year. And also, the stronger the root system the plant has, uh, the more aggressive it is, the harder it is going to be to control or eradicate that plant. Any, Karen, any questions on that? I don't think so. Uh, no, we are good. Thank you. So then the, the next kind of basic uh, botany lesson is this whole weed classification. So we go back to, we have grassy weeds and broadleaf weeds. Um, so grassy weeds are our true monocot. Um, that is a, the vascular system is grass-like. Um, and, and so genetically, they're, they're not anywhere near really related to uh, the other type, the broadleaf, the diacot weeds. Grassy weeds with their structure, you know, corn, all the grasses, uh, a lot of times the, the products that control them do not touch broadleaf weeds or vice versa. Uh, and it's very difficult to control a grass out of a grass, and it's pretty more difficult to control a broadleaf out of a broadleaf. It's easier to control a broadleaf in a grass or a grass in a broadleaf, because here again, their vascular system, uh, their structures, are completely different on how they, they, they process uh, and manufacture food and energy. And of course, then you go back to your botany definition. You can have grassy weeds that are annuals. Here again, they can germinate spring or fall. So here's three examples, you know, crabgrass, foxtail, they germinate in the spring. Annual bluegrass germinates in the fall, but they're still all grassy annual weeds. Um, so here's crabgrass. You know, there's a number of different varieties of crabgrass. Crabgrass normally starts germinating mid to late April when the soil temperatures are getting up in the 50s, uh, and then it rapidly grows fairly fast. And of course, foxtail, um, we can see that in lawns, of course, keep it mowed, so you don't see it quite often, but uh, you'll see it in gardens, other wastelands, uh, where you'll get the, the little foxtail um, bloom-like structures on it. And then, of course, just as you have annuals, you also have perennial grassy weeds. And perennial weeds come back each year from a rhizome or a crown structure. 
um, you know, zoysia, Bermuda grass. Um, in, in our climate, zoysia grass is a desirable turf grass. It, it's not grown all that commonly anymore. Probably I'm say just probably less than three, four, five percent of lawns are zoysia. I think we get more calls in our office on how to kill zoysia that has invaded tall fescue, bluegrass lawns, than we probably get on culture of zoysia. Uh, if you head down south, uh, Bermuda grass tends to be more uh, a, a grass of choice. These are both what we call warm season grasses. They thrive more during the warm parts of the season, kind of like those you know, fall and uh, winter and spring annuals. Um, but Bermuda grass uh, we don't see a lot of Bermuda grass up here. A lot of times people think zoysia that's crept into a yard is Bermuda grass because Bermuda grass in our climate has more of that weed connotation to it. Uh, where I grew up in, in, in southern Kansas, Oklahoma, we saw uh, Bermuda grass quite a bit. Uh, it gets more native, naturalized down in Oklahoma. Uh, it used to be cut, what I'd kind of say on the far northern range for Bermuda. Uh, for the winter kill, it's more what I call a, a southern type grass. And then there's nimble will, which we'll talk about in a second, and then the old Poa trivialis or our rough bluegrass. Um, Dennis, yes, um, will you be uh, discussing control for sea oat as well as wild oats? So I wasn't really going to talk about any chemical control in this presentation. I'm going to make you come back uh, okay. to the next presentation, but on many of these grassy weeds, the only control, there's very, very few what I call selective control. So here again on how herbicides work, there's what's called selective and non-selective herbicides. So a selective herbicide will just target a specific class or group of weeds others. Uh, so 2,4-D will take out broadleaf weeds and not harm the turf, but it won't control a grassy weed. Then you get into non-selective herbicides, and of course the poster child of non-selective herbicide is glyphosate or the Roundup products, and it potentially harms or damages any plant material that is actively growing, whether it be broadleaf weed, grassy weed, monocot, diacot. As far as controlling northern sea oats, uh, I spent a summer or two on my hands and knees with a butcher knife, undercutting every little seedling until I finally eradicated out of my garden. And then if there was any I missed, I made sure that I cut the bloomscape, the seed head off before I went to flower if I missed a plant. You could also spot spray it here again with the non-selective herbicides like the glyphosate products. Those are my only two questions right now. Cool. So just kind of talking a little bit more about, you know, some of the pruno grassy weeds. It's very, very difficult just from looking at Bermuda grass or zoysia grass to identify them. Many of their plant characteristics are very, very similar. Um, you almost have to be under the microscope to, to look at the, the structures uh, of the plant to, to tell the difference. Uh, usually in our climate, Bermuda grass is much more textured. Uh, there's a greater distance between the nodes, the distance from one leaf blade to the next. So this picture here is going to be zoysia. Uh, usually those nodes are maybe a couple, in, one to two inches apart. But on Bermuda grass, those nodes may be three, four, five inches apart, just much more coarser. But of course, research has done a lot on Bermuda grass to make it more finer textured, uh, less coarse, which then makes it a more desirable uh, turf grass. And with a lot of these perennial weeds, especially the grassy weeds, but even on the, the broadleaf weeds, the perennial, a lot of times it's late summer, uh, July, August is the ideal time to control them because in the spring, they're so actively growing um, that a chemical a lot of times just burns the top growth off, but it, it has such a strong root system that it comes back. Whereas we're moving into later summer where the day length is shortening, uh, the plants start then pulling more food energy down into their crowns, into their root systems, and we get a more effective control. So that's how you see a lot of these uh, perennial weeds 
uh, being recommended to control late summer or fall because that chemical is translocated, moves into the plant to kill out those crowns, rhizomes, those growing points, just not burn off the foliage and then it regenerates from the base. Um, nimble will is a relatively- uh, Dennis, yes. I'm sorry, I didn't unmute fast enough. Is clover a weed? And we'll get to clover, we'll get to clover, yes. Okay. And we'll talk about that. Perfect. Remember the definition of a weed is the plant out of place or a plant that is unwanted. When we talk about these, okay? Another perennial weed we see uh, from time to time is one called nimble will. Uh, it's very more upright, very more wispy in its growth and its nature. Um, and it's one probably 10 plus 15 years ago we didn't really see around this part of the, the climate. You know, I growing up here in South, uh, uh, South Kansas, Oklahoma, we had this one growing in our gardens in our yard out on the farm. Uh, but up here I didn't really see it to the last, you know, few years, 10 years or so. Uh, it's another perennial weed. It's another difficult one to control. Um, the glyphosate products is a good option. I think some of our master gardeners have searched out a product called Tenacity, uh, which will selectively control the um, nimble will out of a desirable lawn itself. But it spreads here again by runners and rhizomes. And then probably the, the perennial grassy weed that gives most of us cool season gardeners a run for our money is this one called Poa trivialis, or it's rough bluegrass. So it's related to bluegrass, Kentucky bluegrass. But as you see in this picture, it's, it has these rhizomes, these long, almost stringy like rhizomes. And in the spring when it's cool, it's kind of a lighter green color, uh, finer textured, but like the heat weather we've had this past week or so, it's an extremely cool loving plant and it starts melting out, dying out. So these patches that were once kind of lush then start turning brown and going dormant. And uh, it is a perennial grass. It is very commonly sold in shade mixes in our climate. And so a lot of people unintentionally plant this kind of dusty weed uh, in our turf because they're trying to find a grass that grows in the shade. Unfortunately, it has extremely poor heat drought tolerance. And so it goes dormant. And, and people it's dead, but it comes right back up. And the only way really to control it uh, is to either treat it in the spring when it's actually growing. But here again, you cannot control a bluegrass out of bluegrass or out of a fescue, so you're going to kill your desirable turf. Or you bring a sod cutter in, cut out a piece of sod, and, and put new sod back in. Um, I would just highly recommend if you're using any shade mixes or any what I'd call boxed, pre-boxed grass mixes on the store shelf, bag mixes, you really read the label really close because probably nine times out of 10, people planted Poa trivialis in their yard because in Michigan, Wisconsin, where it's cool, it is a more desirable turf grass in the shade, not in the Midwest. So that's kind of a quick overview of what I think. I'm just going to hit what I think are our main weed problems that we see coming into the hotline. By no means is this every weed that's out there. I guess I should have made that comment earlier on. These are just going to be the, uh, the ones that we see most common, uh, I think, coming into the hotline or getting questions about. And by and large, the vast majority of our weed problems are probably more broadleaf weeds. Uh, than, than the monocots, uh, the grassy-like weeds. Uh, so we look then, switch our gears to some of our broadleaf weeds, our, our diacots. And here again, we have leaves and pears. Uh, we have more of a diffused vascular system. So here again, they're, they're, they're no more close. <coughs> monocot and diacots, no more closely related than a monkey and a giraffe. Uh, you know, they're completely genetically different, um, just the way their plant structure is. Um, and so here again, as I said, it, it's difficult to control a broadleaf out of a broadleaf or a grass out of a grass. Uh, it just gets very more difficult because um, functionally, you know, physiologically, they, they, they function uh, more similar. And of course, just the grassy weeds, you can have uh, annuals, you can have perennials. 
Uh, and like with our grassy weeds, a lot of our uh, annual broadleaf weeds can either germinate in the fall or the spring. So our two probably most common uh, spring um, or fall germinating weeds, but we don't see them till the fall, are henbit and chickweed. And then some of our spring flowering annual weeds, uh, spotted spurge, the little doily-like plant um, that has sap in it. And then one we'll talk about later, day flower, which probably a lot of people don't know what day flower is, but that one germinates in the spring. Uh, so here again, it gets back to timing and control. So these fall germinating ones, like the hen bit, the chickweed, those are gonna be better controlled in the fall, like I said earlier, when they're a small little rosette, as opposed when they're purple and flowering, we're just gonna more or less stunt them back. Uh, but the, the spring germinating ones, they're just dormant. You know, They're just a seed at that point in time. So that's why we need to treat these more as they're germinating, establishing you know, this, this time of year um, before they get large and out of control and into flowering. So like I said, henbit, I think about everyone's familiar with this purple flowering one. It's probably one of our most common ones, uh, winter annuals. Uh, so here again, germinates in the fall, comes up, and it's gone. It's already gone, you know, with the heat of the season. Uh, it's already died out. It's already flowering gone. So it's very short season. And, and kind of same thing with the chickweed. It's another one of those we call winter annuals. I have a little bit of chickweed in my lawn. It's, it's hanging on there, you know, uh, because we've had so many rains and cool, uh, it's, it's kind of hanging on. It did not kind of melt away as quickly as, as some of the, like the, the henbit did. And chickweed probably tends to favor more of the shade, while henbit probably tends to favor more of the sun. So you kind of look at the conditions you have on your landscape, and you can kind of start seeing which one of these weeds, uh, where they tend to, to gravitate to, where they want to germinate. Because just as our annual, you know, our, our desirable flowers we put in our landscape, you know, hostas want to go in the shade, cone flowers want to go in the sun. We kind of get the same thing with our weeds. They, they have their desired locations, uh, on whether they like more sun, shade. Um, you know, a lot of weed will uh, favor compacted soils where uh, turf tends to suffer. So they all kind of have little niches where they, they, they prefer to grow. Hmm. Of course, spurge is probably more now kind of the size, uh, you maybe not quite this big yet this uh, time of year. Um, this one is another one that uh, if you start to develop pull it, a lot of times, a lot of these annuals still have a fairly deep taproot system. So you go to pull that out by hand, it breaks off of the soil surface and it has the ability to regrow. So that's why sometimes you undercut them or after a good rain, you go out there and weed a lot of these uh, young uh, establishing weeds and easily pull them from the garden. Um, once it gets more into the seeded stage, uh, here again, it's one of those, spurge is one of those plants that has a great dispersal method. You go in there and start messing with that plant, it knows it's being moved, and so it starts popping off and spreading the seed. Uh, even as you're carrying it out of the garden, it's releasing those seeds uh, back to the garden itself. So it goes without saying that we also want to control all these weeds before they set their seed. Because um, here again, one of the reasons that they're a weed is because they set a lot of seed the seed has relatively few requirements for germination, and uh, they're just laying there in wait. Uh, there could be thousands of seeds, uh, you know, per, per several square feet uh, in the garden, and they can lay dormant for a long period of time. Um, one that uh, we see more common is one called Black Medic. Uh, this is another annual in our garden. This one has really taken off in the last few weeks. Uh, a lot of people think it's clover with a yellow flower, but it's not related to white clover. It is a legume, so it is, is it related that way. But its leaf looks much like a, a clover leaf, but it is not. Uh, Black medic flowers yellow, and it gets the name because as the seeds develop, they develop. Uh, it's another one uh, that's got a very, I've never seen this weed. The, the stems are very wiry. They're very tough and I've got this in a patch in my yard where the grass is really thin uh, and it likes to be in a more shady area than full sun but you think you pulled it up and, it, and, and the, that tap where it holds that crown that growing point so tight that what you do is really just break off all the, the tendrils the, the, the arm 
speak, the shoots, and, and it comes right back on you. Um, and so this is one that we're seeing more of uh, in the last few years. It also, I think, germinates better when we have our wet springs. Uh, because that saying, most plants are going to germinate better when, when there's a good supply of moisture. Karen, I, I see a few more questions that popped up. Do you have anything you need to add? Uh, yes, I do. Um, is there an app that can help you identify weeds? You know, I'm going to say no. Um, that would be something if people want to maybe put something in the chat box. There are a number of different plant apps out there, but my concern is they may get you close. Um, unfortunately, you know, weeds are, are vary across the United States. And so my, my problem with identification apps is, and I think this discussion came up maybe a week or so, someone was trying to identify something uh, I had posted on the Facebook page on the Let's Play hotline using an app and it came up with, you know, some plant that I think grew in Florida or somewhere. That, that's my problem with the apps. They're not localized enough for, for our region. Um, you know, those volunteers that have worked the hotline, you know, when we get weed pictures in, there's two or three reference books we go to. Uh, one is Weeds of the Great Plains. Uh, that's a publication out in Nebraska. And that has the vast majority of weeds we see in our climate. Um, there's also a book called Weeds of the West we use quite a bit, which tends to be, um, as it says, weeds of the West tend to be maybe a little more drier climate than we are here in the Kansas City area. Um, but those are our two good uh, books. The other problem with weeds is the seedling stage a lot of times looks different than the mature stage. Just as, you know, we plant a, a carrot seed and, you know, a little carrot that comes up or a beet or a radish doesn't look like a mature plant. And so sometimes that gets very difficult to identify from that standpoint. Okay, and this is a, a miscellaneous question. Why are birds, why are weed seeds put into bird seed? Well, that's a really great question because the definition of a weed is a plant out of place. So technically, I think you're probably thinking of some of those inexpensive bird seed mixes that contain a lot of the millets, um, milo, maize, those type of things that birds really don't eat. So technically those wouldn't be considered a weed seed. Um, really I would consider those more of just a poor bird choice for the type of songbirds and wildlife we're trying to attract. Um, they put them in there because they're cheap filler. Uh, to bring down the cost uh, of bird seed because better quality seeds. And, and so those really inexpensive mixes that have the Milo and um, in them the little red, orange, little you know BB sized berries, most birds don't eat that. I think that's a problem. So I don't think they're really putting true weed seeds in there. They're just putting uh, product in there that the birds don't prefer. And then they germinate all over your yard. Got it. Oh, uh, Dennis, I'm sorry. Um, one more question. Should you compost weeds that you pull? Should you compost weeds that you pull? My take on that is if they have not gone to seed and they would decompose fairly rapidly, I would compost them. If it's a plant that's already full of seeds, I would send that to our compost recycling facility. Backyard compost, the way most gardeners make it, is never going to generate enough heat to sterilize, to kill the weed seeds. And then when you spread that compost out, you have the risk of spreading the seed. So young, immature weeds would be a nice green source for your compost bin, but mature plants full of weed seeds, I would put them in that brown paper craft bag and get them out of my yard. Okay, that's all for now. Okay. So here's Dayflower. Uh, a lot of people like this because it has the, probably the 
prettiest blue flower uh, of anyone that's seen it. Um, you know, this name, this plant, people used to kind of confuse with another plant that had a inappropriate name at this point in time, thinking it was a perennial secretia, uh, which had a wondering name to it that I'm not going to mention right now. Uh, but this one is a, a reseeding annual, and it's another one that uh, if you let it go, it, it's a vining plant. You know, it looks almost like it would be more of a desirable plant with that blue flower, but it has a knack to get in amongst a lot of your perennials in your garden and become a problem. Um, and if you let these flowers develop, then it's going to spread those seeds from, from year to year. Uh, when we get, we see not a lot of day flower questions coming on the hotline, but we do get a few uh, each year. And it's just one of those interesting flowers because of the blue flower. That's what draws a lot of attention, uh, people to it. Uh, it. It's just that beautiful, bright flower. But, but I would put this under the, the weed category. And then, of course, there's the famous knotweed. Uh, you know, I, I've had the personal experience of identifying this as knotweed and the person responding back to me, yes, it is a weed. Well, it's K-N-O-T, not N-O-T. Knotweed um, is one that really loves compacted soil. This one germinates probably back in February, March, before we put down a lot of the crabgrass controls but then it kind of develops this kind of a stimmy appearance. Um, you know, back when I was a student at K-State, this one just loved to grow where, what I would call students cow path, the lawn. So in other words, instead of walking on the sidewalk, they would cut, you know, the straight line across the, the turf and then they would kill it out. And then you would have the edges of these pads, you would have the most wonderful crop of knotweed uh, that you you see it a lot of times on people that have gravel drives, walkways, uh, it'll, it'll pop up on that from those compacted soils. Uh, it's a difficult one to control because, um, like I said, the, the, the pre-emergent products are put on too late to control it because it germinates so early. And then once it gets to the size you see here, uh, it's very difficult to treat with a broadleaf herbicide. It doesn't have a lot of foliage on it. And it, it does still tend to die out as it gets hot hotter and drier. And then I think a lot of people, uh, especially those Monet gardeners, and now Garden Gallery has started having an issue with, with hairy crabweed or mulberry weed. This is another one of those plants that probably 10, 15 years ago, never ever heard of. You know, when it started to be a problem out at Monet, we had to send a sample in to the herbarium uh, to kind of identify it. So this is one that I think has been transported um, basically by the changes, I think, in our climate, and then also more with nursery stock being moved from, from place to place as these seeds are in the containers and the bald and burlap, and then they take over. Hairy crabweed, uh, also called mulberry weed. So if you look at this picture over here, that's exactly what a young mulberry seedling potentially could look like. Uh, very, very strong taproot system. So you go to pull this plant up, it breaks off at the soil surface, it comes back. Um, it gets the name hairy crabweed because of the hairy structure. And then once these seeds develop over here, um, they can, once it's mature, um, they can pop, as I said earlier, those seeds can spread four feet or more uh, just from that, um, that structure, that mechanism, how they disperse the seed. As far as I know, there are no pre-emergents on the market that are labeled for hairy crabweed for control. And so right now you're back to pretty much hand uh, eradication. And here again, these are mostly in desirable perennial garden planting. So a lot of the broadleaf herbicides are off the table because of the vapor action. And so chemically you're pretty much left as a homeowner to the glyphosate Roundup products as a method of control. Okay, before I move into perennial broadleaf weeds, Karen, any other? questions we need to address? No, but I would like to point out that, well, actually I do have one question. Mulberry has three different shaped leaves. Is that due to age? So now we're talking about the true mulberry tree, uh, not the mulberry weed or hairy crab weed. So okay. yes, a, a seedling mulberry tree can take on about three different leaf 
patterns. When it's immature, you get kind of more of the heart shape uh, with serrated edges. You can get one that's very deeply lobed and one that's just got some minor lobing to them. So yes, mulberry tree seedlings can get tricky to identify because they can take on multiple different patterns. But keep in mind, that is a perennial weedy tree weed. What I'm talking about with hairy crabweed is an annual plant. Probably at maturity gets maybe a foot, two foot tall, uh, and then dies of the frost. Perfect, thanks for the explanation. And I just wanna point out, um, if you're not aware of the group chat function, there's a lot of great information in there from your fellow EMGs when people post it to everyone and then people respond. So I encourage you to check it out. Yeah, I, we haven't really talked that much about the chat feature, but um, it is a, a great way to communicate. You know, when we're, we're together at the church, we don't want to whisper and talk to each other, but on the chat feature, uh, you certainly can uh, communicate. And I feel kind of handicapped because I'm not monitoring the chat box. So I don't know what you're saying out there. You're saying, oh, Dennis, you're doing a bad job. I've had enough of this. Uh, what's going on? So yeah, do, do use that. If you pull down that, that uh, taskbar menu, it just says chat. And then you just type right into that. Or if you just want to send a message to someone, you can uh, pull up a little bit. It says two. And then you can find the name of the person and you can send it directly to them if you don't want to go to everyone. So that chat box is very, very helpful when it comes to Zoom. And you know, while I'm thinking about that, I'm gonna scroll on you for a second. So I, I wanna plug, I know a lot of you have been logging on to the weekly Wednesday K-State Gardening Hour. Um, those are scheduled right now every Wednesday through July, I believe, uh, with a one hour presentation. There's been three of them held so far. There's one tomorrow. I think Karen's been doing a great job in the weekly email of posting that link for you. Um, also, I think I put it on Facebook and you do have to pre-register for that and they send you a code uh, to be able to get in. But those are great sessions uh, that would all count for advanced training hours. And I'm very proud, you know, I think the last week's session, there was like 200, 300 people on and there must've been 50, 60 people uh, from Johnson County alone, and they weren't all master gardeners. We get a list back of who signed on, and there were a lot of just uh, public people that I did not recognize. So I just want to put a plug in for that K-State Garden Hour while I think about it. I want to do that, and I forgot to do it. My mind scrolls. Okay, uh, so let's look now at some perennial broadleaf weeds. Uh, these are ones that come back year after year from our crown, just like perennials in our garden. Um, by and large, I'm going to say perennial broadleaf weeds and grassy broadleaf weeds, well, broadleaf is a general, uh, or excuse me, perennials in general, rule of thumb, are just much more difficult to control um, because of that aggressive root system that most of them have. Um, and speaking of that, it is bindweed. Um, field bindweed is, is classified as noxious weed in Kansas. I know it's a problem. We've got patches of it here in Garden Gallery. A few other demonstration gardens have it. If you've ever been to the Kansas State Fair, they had a, uh, um, a dried plant of bindweed and it shows the root system. And it's probably in a, in a glass, plexiglass panel, probably, oh, 10 feet high, 15 feet long. And it shows how aggressive that root system is. I mean, it can go deep into the soil and so that's why it's difficult to, uh, to control. Uh, the pictures here both show it with a white flower. There is also, uh, and I think the pinkish flower is what we see most commonly growing around here, uh, the field bindweed. There's several different species of it. And it can either grow, grow flat along the ground, kind of with this heart-shaped leaf, or it can bind up on uh, fences. Uh, you see it on chain link fences very commonly. It'll bind up on plant materials. Uh, it's a twiner, uh, so it just twists its way up. And um, it is best controlled here again uh, in that July, August time frame as it starts to prepare itself for winter. Uh, and it's probably one of those that's not going to be controlled in one season, one application. You're looking at probably several years. 
uh, of control. Uh, because not only does it come back from the root system, but it can also exceed itself. Uh, this is not morning glory. We've had people send pictures in wanting to know what species of morning glory they had growing on their fence. And uh, even though it has a morning glory like flower, that flower is probably only an inch or so in, in diameter, uh, not, not large, but it, it can be fairly colorful when it's in, in flower. And of course, uh, our good old friend dandelion. Uh, a lot of us think of dandelions as an annual because it reseeds itself so freely, but technically that, that taproot system can come back year after year. Uh, here again, uh, it's a rosette overwintering, or even now that it's hot, it goes back to that little rosette growth. Uh, and then when spring comes, it bursts into flower. Um, and so here again, fall is the ideal time. Uh, dandelions is one of those plants that have kind of become controversial. This is not a native plant. This is one that was introduced to the United States and has uh, prospered greatly. Uh, and it is probably to a lot of people, it's probably the best source of pollen early in the season for honeybee activity. So there is a movement now trying to eliminate or, or reduce the amount of dandelions we control uh, to provide more pollen. Uh, but here again, remember the definition of a weed. Um, you know, and is it, is it out of place in your landscape? And if it is, you know, potentially control it. If you're trying to do your best for pollinators, those type of things, then you may consider leaving some of them in waste areas uh, or other areas where they could be uh, a beneficial uh, pollen source. Oh, poison ivy. Uh, this one, for some reason, the last few years seems to be really enjoying our really wet summers. Um, it can be transmitted uh, a lot of times by birds. So the birds eat the berries that develop. This is the flower, the poison ivy you're seeing here, then a little box berry, probably BB size will develop. Birds, wildlife eat those and then they deposit them. That's why a lot of times you see poison ivy showing up uh, in fence rows, head rows, those type of things under power lines, because that's where birds uh, tend to drop them off. Um, you know, um, it's the old leaves, leaves of three, let it be, but how do you tell it from some of the other plants? So if you look at this leaf, I, I think you can see my cursor coming down. You can see these two leaves. This is the petiole of the leaf. So you can see these two leaflets are attached directly to the stem of the poison ivy. And then the third leaf, there's an elongated petiole that comes out. And so that to me is one of the classic identifications of how to tell if it's poison ivy or another plant of three. So if you look at all these leaves, you can see those two opposite leaves are attached directly to the leaf petiole. The third pointed leaf then has that elongated petiole to identify poison ivy. And the thing about poison ivy is it can be a vine, it can be a shrub, it can lay on the ground, it can travel 20 feet up a tree. Uh, it kind of just has the habit of, of taking on what it can potentially grow on. So it, it can be in a number of different settings and have different um, size texture, but you're always gonna see uh, those leaves of three issue with, with poison ivy. So white clover, uh, this question came up early about white clover, is it a weed or not? And I'm gonna go back to my conversation I just had uh, about, uh, you know, is it a problem in your lawn or is it a desirable plant? So there is a move now, because uh, white clover is also a great source of uh, pollen for native pollinators and honeybees. In fact, we get a handful of calls every year for people wanting to plant white clover in their lawn, or people wanna to go to a white clover only lawn. In my experience is that white clover as a monoculture, like you would see in a typical turf situation, is not a, is not a good plant. Uh, it's a cool season plant. It doesn't like the heat of the summer. Uh, it's been doing great this year because of the cool conditions and the rain, but it's probably best just left. If you want to, you know, have encourage white clover, uh, decrease your fertilization in the lawn. Um, don't use broadleaf herbicides, and naturally it will come in there without probably planting it. But but trying to maintain a lawn of just clover 
Uh, you know, the trend now is for bee friendly lawns. This would probably be one of the best plants for our part of the country in a bee friendly lawn would be white clover. But for those that like that manicured lawn, then the white flowers is definitely uh, off-putting. Um, and, and so here again, uh, a lot of times people try to control it in the spring and all they do is burn the top growth off and it comes right back. So a lot of times you can get this one more late summer, fall, but you tend to have a more effective control period. Yep, wood sorrel or oxalis. A lot of people think this is an annual, but actually it, it is a perennial. It comes back year after year. Um, this one can be a problem in the lawn. I, I think we see more problems, or at least I see more problems of it in perennial garden where it starts popping on, um, um, amongst your other you know, clumps of perennials, things like that. Uh, it is an edible plant. Some people will eat yellow wood sorrel. I'm not gonna recommend you do that in this presentation because this is not an edible plant uh, uh, presentation. Um, but anyway, this is another one of the little pesky weeds. It has that little clover-like look to it, uh, yellow flower, but this is not white clover. It's not black medic. Uh, it is uh, oxalis or, or commonly called yellow wood sorrel. And another one that may bring up a little uh, controversy is, is this one called honey vine milkweed. So it is in the milkweed family. Uh, it would be a potential host for the monarch butterfly. Um, and maybe I'll get corrected by someone more knowledgeable out there, but what I have read and experienced, this is probably not one of the first preferences for the monarch butterfly to, to lay and feed upon. It is one of our native milkweeds. It can vine you know, six, eight feet or more. Um, you know, a couple years ago, I thought, gosh, I have the most vigorous clematis I have ever had in my garden. <laughs> Got up close and looked at it, you know, and three fourths of it was honey vine milkweed that had vined up in there. Um, the white flowers, and then of course it gets these big uh, seed pods that are probably three, four inches long in diameter, maybe an inch, uh, or excuse me, long and maybe an inch or so in diameter. And then as those mature, they, they pop open and, and they're full of that, you know, um, fluffy milkweed seed that we're used to. Um, the, the problem with current, a honey vine milkweed is that it just sprouts up throughout the garden. It just doesn't stay in one spot or clump. Uh, in my own garden, uh, the other day I walked through and I probably found it in probably half a dozen different spots. And each little segment shoot was probably, you know, two, three feet high already vining up on some of my perennials. Um, and they were probably 10 feet apart. Uh, so you just don't know where it's going to pop up. You know, as well behaved, just came up in one spot. You know, it might be more desirable, but when it kind of starts then overtaking, you know, your desirable plants, that's when it needs to be controlled. And I put pokeweed in here for fun. Uh, it is a perennial. Uh, most people think of it as an annual because uh, it reseeds so freely. But this is one we get a lot of uh, calls on. I know when I was manning the hotline back in March, October, I probably got a half a dozen photographs of pokeweed at this stage where most people really start recognizing it when it gets up great uh, taller. And then when it gets these purple berries on it that the birds love to devour. Uh, here again, in some cultures, pokeweed is an edible plant, but I'm gonna tell you pokeweed is a poisonous plant unless you know how to properly prepare it. Um, but uh, chopping it out, hoeing it out is probably your best bet uh, with, with pokeweed. And then of course, a lot of people are gonna recognize ground ivy. Some people call it creeping charlie. Uh, it gets to be a, a lawn invader. It gets to be a perennial garden invader. Um, some people choose to embrace this as a potentially desirable ground cover, uh, while others don't. Um, it, it's another one very difficult to, to control. It's another one of those where fall treatments are probably going to be superior to spring treatments uh, with, with ground ivy itself. And another one of those potentially controversial weeds is wild violets. Um, violets here again, I believe, are the host to a number of frutillaria, um, frutillaria butterflies, uh, but also wild violets reseed very freely. Uh, they have a little rhizome structure uh, that makes them more difficult to control. And like I said, they reseed. 
Um, they tend to be in shady areas. So here again, some people will embrace them in a, in a perennial garden or shady areas where if you're a typical um, lawn, you know, trying to go for that nice manicured lawn, they get to be a problem. Uh, I know in my own yard, I let them pop up in a few places uh, where it's shady, where the grass doesn't grow that great. In other areas, I will spot spray or, or, or eradicate them out of the perennial garden. So I, I kind of do a kind of a give and take with, with the wild violets. Uh, and here again, a lot of these perennial plants, the typical 2,4-D uh, broadleaf herbicides that are in a lot of these like Weed Be Gone products, Trimec, those type of things do a really poor job on controlling these. A lot of times we need a, a stronger product like the uh, Triclopyr, other products that control some of these. Uh, hand eradication on a lot of these, you know, violets. I, I in my flower garden, I, I cut them out with a butcher knife, uh, pull them out where I don't want them and thin them out and then don't use uh, chemical control. And, and one that's, uh, I think this is the last one I, I, I've got, maybe there's another one after this, but one that's really on the increase that we're seeing um, samples come into or people ask questions about is one called white avens. It's in, it's in the GM family. It is a perennial and early in the spring, you see this rose that foliage. You want to almost think, wow, this is the most, you know, this could be a coral bell plant. It's got this really beautiful uh, kind of reddish uh, fern-like foliage, but then it puts up a flower stalk and then it has these little white flowers, but then these are full of what I call little stick tight seeds. They're probably the size of a small BB, very small BB, and they're just full of all these little hook-like appendages. And uh, they get easily caught into your socks, your pant legs, um, pet fur uh, can come in with them. And so um, it's uh, a lot of people don't notice it'll start the flower, uh, but then once it gets to the flowering stage, it really is kind of a, a fairly um, nasty weed. Now, I, I tell this story and maybe why I, I know more about this plant is when we had our dog Clancy, um, he was out in the garden one day, came in and his muzzle was just covered with these Avon seeds. And so basically I had to sit on the floor and take a pair of scissors and just cut the hair off his muzzle his face, uh, to get those stick tights out of there. There was no other way to get rid of them. And so this is one you gotta be on the lookout for. This one will pop up in flower garden. Uh, a lot of times it kind of pops up in shady kind of uh, areas where the grass doesn't grow. It kind of has that ability to kind of just tuck itself in where you really don't notice it uh, and, and get away from you. So I'm going to stop there, Karen. I, I went kind of a while on the uh, perennial broadleaf weeds. What questions popped up? Um, no specific questions at this point. You know, I've noticed that people are anxious to hear you discuss various treatments. Um, so I think that your next session will be well attended. Um, wild violets seem to be one that a couple people are interested in trying to control them specifically in Creeping Charlie. Um, I've noted in the chat that you will be discussing them in our next session, uh, but that's up to you. Yeah, you know, since we're trying to do these shorter, you know, hour to 90 minute Zooms, and this is going to go a little long since we started about 20 minutes late because of the, the mix up on, on Zoom links. Um, this one, I originally did this program, I did a couple years ago for the Missouri Master Gardeners, and we did a two part. So we did a one, an hour, and then we followed up the next hour uh, with treatment. So it kind of married together a little bit nicer than the Mrs. Marrying together here today. Hopefully uh, it'll work. And of course, you can always call the hotline uh, with, with your question. But a lot of these perennial broadleaf weeds, triclopyr, TRI, PLO, excuse me, TRI, CLO, PYR is going to be your chemical of choice, triclopyr. Okay. That's all for now. Okay, cool. Thanks, Karen. Then the, the third classification of weeds we really haven't talked about yet are the sedges. Uh, and they're not true monocots, they're not true diacots, they're not true broadleaf, they're not true grassy, they're their own classification. And, and sedges have edges, is, is the kind of the, the, the terminology you want to remember. And they have this triangular stick. 
And of course, the sedge most people know about is, is the nut grass, nut sedge, water grass, and the lawn. So now sedges have become very popular in the perennial garden. Uh, there's a number of different varieties uh, that are used uh, in shady areas, in the moist areas, uh, in the perennial garden. But the yellow nut sedge, so if you would pull a stem of the sedge up and kind of roll it around your fingers, or, or hold it up or cut through it, you'd almost see a triangular shape to the stem. And that's how you identify a sedge. All sedges have that triangular stem. So if people bring in a grass-like weed for you, uh, we had one last week, you know, we were headed down the path that it was a grassy weed. But as soon as you looked at that stem, you could tell it was a sedge. We were able to identify it then. And so like I said, the, the one uh, we're thinking about, and most of the sedges are, are perennial in our area, is the yellow nut sedge, which goes by water grass, nut grass, uh, there's probably a few other names people give it. Um, and that tends to be probably the most common one that we have. Um, and we get yellow nut sedge because it has a very chartreuse light green foliage. And it gets the name nut sedge because at the end of the roots are these little, they call them nutlets, that are formed and developed. So the old wives tale as you pull this plant out, this nutlet breaks off in the soil and then it starts a new plant. Uh, so some people say, well, if you pull it, you actually create more sedge. And I'm going to say, not really, because the more you pull it, the more you stay on it, the less established, the more mature it is because of the perennial. You can slowly weaken it out in small areas. And the other problem is with sedges is, since they're not a true broadleaf weed, they're not a true grass-like weed, pretty much all the herbicides used to control broadleaf weeds, grassy weeds, have very, very poor effect on sedges. And, and so there are two products on the market for homeowners that are specifically made for sedges. Uh, you know, one is the, has the name Sedge Hammer. You see it's got halo zinfide in it. And then there's another one called Sulfentrazone that is like an, an ortho product for weed, uh, for sedge control. Uh, and here again, there's not one application that's probably gonna control the, the sedges out of our yard. Any specific question on sedges? I saw a few more questions pop up. If not, we'll move on. Um, no. Okay. Thanks, Good. Karen. Okay. Then there's a few other kind of funky weeds out there. Um, horsetail ex exquitum. I can't say that this morning. Ex ex I'll just call it horsetail. I'm tongue tied. Um, this is probably one of the oldest plants out there on, on in, in uh, out there in our gardens. Um, um, it's a vascular plant. It reproduces by spores, so it's not really related to any other plants. It's this tall, kind of wispy, jointed plant. Not the ferns down here. This is the the horsetail exquitum, um, and this is something you'll see sold sometimes for bog plants for wet areas. And this is honestly one you probably really don't want to get started in your garden. Occasionally you'll see it pop up in some bald and burlap plants, but there's really no good control for this except just kind of roguing it out. But it's kind of one of those fun plants that, that this pops up from, from time to time. Okay, our, our last section is going to be more or less on what I would call the, the true exotic plants that have become invasive. And I don't know if Nancy Chapman's on, on the, the conference today, but about Nancy has a whole hour, hour and a half program on invasive plants. In other words, plants that we have planted in our landscape that have uh, escaped into our natural areas. Um, she did it for us as an evening class a couple years ago, um, and she's done it out at the field day before. But if you want uh, all the potential exotic plants, Nancy's probably got the, the best list out there. Uh, you know, she even got some of the, the miscanthus grasses, a few other ones on there. But probably the, the main ones that people are concerned with that we see more commonly, uh, first of all, is lithrum. And, and this one's a fairly controversial plant. Um, the problem with lithrum is it recedes freely uh, in waterways, wet areas. So here's the problem with lithrum. If you just have one species of lithrum, one variety, it is self-sterile. 
you start mixing different genetics together, then it sets seed and it receives itself. So most people say, I've never seen this plant reseed in my garden. That's because you only have probably the one species, uh, the one variety that can is self-sterile, but then it starts cross-pollinating. This one plant's also confusing because this is a banned plant for sale in the state of Kansas. It is not banned from having in your landscape, but it is illegal to transport it or give it to someone else. Now, what makes it more complicated is you can buy this plant on the Missouri side. It is not banned for sale in Missouri. And why it's not is beyond me. Uh, we get several calls about this every year. We just had one a week ago from actually uh, one of the large retail uh, growers here about Kansas rules and, and lithrum. Um, so if you have lithrum in your garden, the socially just thing probably to do would be dig it out and remove it. If no one's going to force you to dig it out, no one's going to force you to remove it. But keep in mind, if you go in and divide it, technically you're violating rules because you're transporting it or moving it. Um, so interesting little bit, uh, uh, tidbit. Uh, so you can't give it to your friends legally. We've removed it from all our demonstration gardens just to be a good role model. Um, but what I see all the time is commercial landscapes go in where they purchase the plants on the Missouri side, and then we have lithium. Uh, and there are areas around Johnson County where you'll see it popping up uh, in, uh, in um, along, you know, drainage ditches, those type of things, kind of the areas where cattails might uh, want to grow. And then, of course, I think everyone's familiar with the, the honeysuckles that are taking over our woodlands. You know, there's many eradication programs for that. Uh, it's one of the first plants to leaf out in the spring. And then a, a lot of people recognize it by the red berries uh, late in the season. Um, and, and this one, there are a lot of crews that are eradicating. In the 16, 17 years we've been in this building, uh, it's been amazing the way the little wooded area behind the building, how the, uh, the amur, the, the Japanese honeysuckle, the, has uh, spread in those woodlands. So if you have it in your landscape, most people don't. But what I also see is it, it pops up in gardens a lot and people will send us uh, uh, pictures wanting to have it identified. And if it's really young on a wet soil, it pops, pulls up really easily. And then of course the old ornamental pear, the Bradford pear. Um, here again, when there was just Bradford pear on the market, it was self-sterile. In other words, it didn't produce a seed. But then we started getting aristocrat, chanticleer, red spire, all these other varieties of ornamental pear, it then started cross-pollinating. And you got the seeds that were kind of, you know, large berry, you know, size, uh, pea size. And then the birds would come in, devour those seeds. They would then uh, distribute them uh, far and wide. And now you've got ornamental pear popping up. So um, where the honeysuckle takes the woodlands, ornamental pear takes more of what I call the grasslands. And you see it a lot of times in roadsides and the ditches uh, kind of areas that are, are low maintained uh, grassy areas uh, with ornamental pear. And it's very, very common uh, in the spring. You can see it when it's in flower. It kind of goes away this time of year when it's just, just green itself. Um, here again, if you have an ornamental pear in your yard landscape, no one's going to come by and tell you to take it out. Um, but, you know, here again, uh, is it a plant that we really want to be showcasing knowing that it has potential to, to, to spread? And then winter creeper euonymus uh, is another one. It was used to be one of our most popular ground covers because it would thrive in the sun or the shade. Uh, this picture here on the left was taken at the Kaufman Garden a few years ago when the Kaufman Garden first went in. They have now eradicated uh, the winter creeper euonymus underneath uh, those hedges. The problem is once it kind of grows more upright, that's when it starts to flower and seed and become more of an invasive plant. Uh, and so that's another one that's kind of escaped our environment. So with that, I will open it up to questions. And I guess we, either Karen, you can ask, or if you guys want to unmute, unmute your mic, uh, we can uh, 
open up to questions. I'm just going to ask one question and then I would ask everybody to unmute and ask Dennis directly. The one that came up in the chat room is hemlock is in full bloom along the trails. How much of a problem regarding casual contact or brushing? You know, to me with casual contact on the hemlock, it is, is relatively low. Um, you know, here again, when it comes to, to, to brushing up against it, we all have different uh, sensitivities to various, you know, plants, even poison ivy. So now, you know, if you're out walking, jogging, you brush against a, a plant, a leaf, or something like that, I don't think the average person would have any problem with any type of reaction. It's more the ingestion of the, the hemlock itself. Uh, I know I pulled it by hand and you know, chopped it out. I've had any rashes or with it. Dennis? Yes. This is Vicki. <laughs> I uh, just uh, got uh, uh, cured from handling the, uh, the hemlock at Wonderscope. Uh, I used my gloves uh, and scratched my ear and it blew out my mastoid. Um, and so it is very toxic. So that's a warning. If you pull it, uh, destroy your gloves. So it's a sap then more so than probably just a casual brush with a leaf is what I'm hearing you say, Vicki? Yes. Uh, it, it gets on your gloves, and if you touch your eyes, face, ears, anything, it will uh, be absorbed in your skin. I had uh, a very severe reaction, so, and I'm fine now, but uh, it raised blood pressure. It, uh, it makes you dizzy. Um, so there are some of the symptoms, so don't even touch it. <laughs> okay. Thank you for doing that, Vicki. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, a lot of times on these plants, you know, the, the thing about poison ivy, it, it's more or less contact, but some of it is, is the sap. So, um, yeah, you just got to be, be cautious. Dennis? Yes. This is Janet. How do you get rid of Ruella? Which, get rid of what? Ruella, native pans, uh, native petunia. Oh, Ruella. Well, yeah, that's one of those... Unfortunately, some of those native plants that are finding their way into the garden get to be a problem because they spread fairly aggressively. And, and wild petunia, ruella, that's going to be one you're going to have to probably spot, treat, spray with uh, glyphosate, just you know where it pops up in your garden, just, just hit it um, and, and slowly weaken it out that way. Um, that's why I think we need a lot of times we need to do our due diligence on before we plant these plants because one of my early slides was unfortunately we, um, we we plant a lot of these in our garden not knowing um, that they can get away from us. Yeah it's taken over the iris garden at Loose Park. Yeah and that either some either well probably that might have been planted in the rain garden or some other place. Um, because you do see that as a fairly common rain garden plant up on the edges. Okay. Dennis? Yep. This is Julie. I have a question about the, the grass, the Bermuda grass that gets up into flower beds. If you spray it in the flower bed, will that transport the chemical back into the plant and, and uh, kill the lawn? Um, no. Um, most of the, if you're killing the Bermuda grass, there is some over the top products we'll talk about next week, like Fusillade, uh, over the top, I think is the name of it. There are some selective grass control products you can use like in a flower garden, iris, those type of things. But no, it does not follow the runner, the plant back, so it gets it in the lawn. It pretty much is just contact um, material. That, is that is that was, you, was that your question? Same uh, way with yeah. like glyphosate. It will only hit the part of the plant. It doesn't really translocate it very far um, into the plant. Okay. Uh, can you treat um, grass that's gotten in among daylilies? 
Uh, that would have to look at the over the top product. Or the Fusillade is one of them. Uh, and see if Daylilies is on the label. That I don't know for sure. I know Iris is on the label, which is a monocot, but I'm not sure about Daylilies. Dennis. Yes. This is Jack. Uh, what's the name of the viney weed that grows up through uh, understory trees? It has many, many, many uh, black thorns on it, and it grows rapidly right straight up in, into the trees and shrubs. So are you thinking more in the native areas, Jack? Uh, no, it, 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 it pops up uh, in gardens and in uh, okay. a lot of places, usually a single stem. So when, I'm, when, when someone tells me about a, a, a vine with a lot of thorns, uh, I think of a native woodland vine called greenbrier. Uh, there's a couple different species of greenbrier, and I've seen them get established in gardens themselves, uh, but they have kind of a shiny green leaf, and then the stem is very thorny, but it's probably a, a species of greenbrier would be my guess. Um, and it will cling to trees, and so that's probably my guess. It, it also sometimes can produce a little berry on it, but usually it doesn't get that mature. Thank you. Yeah, look up Greenbrier and see if that <clears throat> isn't what you're thinking about. Okay. Hi, Dennis. Yes. This is Deb W. Um, I have a question about the um, honeysuckle and getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we back up to a creek, which is mostly dry. And our neighbors are concerned that we shouldn't be cutting that stuff out of there because it's not our property. It's kind of common ground, I guess. What's, is there some resources or something through the county that uh, tells us when we can go in and get rid of it or how to get rid of it, or not how to get rid of it, but what we have the right to get rid of? Well, it creeps if, up into my backyard. Yeah, if it's, if it's not on your property, then you probably need a huh, right to go in there, you know, potentially uh, eradicate it. Of course, what people don't know won't hurt them, but most eradication programs happen in, in the fall, winter, time period where it's, where it's dormant uh, for a couple of reasons. First of all, the tick issue gets to be a lot less of a problem during the, the winter dormant season. And so a lot of people do in these cleanups, they'll go through with, with saws, loppers, they will cut, cut it off close to the ground and then they'll treat it with a, a herbicide such as Tordon uh, to kill um, the, the, the stump because you put it right onto the cut surface. So that by far is the most common is dormant season because uh, you can pretty much evenly identify it during the dormant time and uh, then uh, cut it, treat it, and that should take care of it. But on someone else's property, um, boy, you'd probably, you know, if no one really claims the property, yeah, that that's gets to be more of a sticky wicket. Yeah, I'll probably have to check with our HOA or something like that because I don't, I don't really know, but it keeps coming into my backyard and I keep cutting it when it comes into the yard, but it's not going to take care of the problem. So thank you. Yeah. yeah, I probably pull four or five plants out of my garden, little seedlings every year, and I have no idea where that's coming from. So the birds are carrying it far and wild. Um, and Vicki just said, talk to your city environmental department. Um, they, yeah, that might be an option too. Um, but here again, it's probably getting back to landowner responsibility. And then, you know, Dave asked, how far north has kudzu come? I think I, in my almost 40 years, if I've seen kudzu in Johnson County once, that's probably it. What most people report is kudzu around here, or a lot of times one of the species of our native grape vines uh, that tend to have a fairly large. But I've not seen it this far north. And honestly, you know, in my, in my Southern Kansas, I haven't really seen kudzu in, in that part yet. So I'm, I'm not for sure how far north. I think it's still more of a, a menace to the south. Now as our winters warm, um, the potential range of that is gonna continue to move north. Dennis? Yep. This is Carol Gast. I've been um, pulling lots of what I thought was gray green wood sorrel 
using my book as the identifier, but it looks just like your yellow sorrel. Are they one in the same? What I see mostly here is the yellow wood sorrel. There could be some other species out there. I, I'm not familiar with gray wood sorrel. I'd have to look that one up. Yeah, I looked up in that Nebraska book and the picture looks just like your picture of the yellow. So now I'm confused on what I'm handling. So it could also be back to the common name. You know, um, plants have many different common names. And so it could be we're talking about the same plant just with a different common name. So we need to get back, if it's, it sounds like it's both an oxalis, but we just need to make sure we're talking about the same okay. species. We know, we're the, we know we're in the right genus. It's yes. common snake root. It's uh, San, San Nicula, San Nicula odorata. That's oh. what the yellow is. Right. Now when I hear the word snake root, I think it's something completely different. I think of a, of a white flowering late summer, tall plant. Yeah. It's, it's a yellow flower that uh, she was asking about and it does have the sticky ticks on it. So uh, that is what the, it, it looks like wood sorrel. Okay. Yeah, this, this oxalis yellow wood sorrel does not have a stick tight uh, flower or a seed pod to it. Right, that's what I found. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any others? I am sorry that we had the confusion at the start. I guess you guys were confused. It was just me that was confused. Uh, I wonder why no one was on my Zoom meeting at uh, 8.59. So at least we figured out why. You guys are probably wondering where I was. So okay. Any other questions? If not, it is 10.35. Uh, Remember, we didn't have a lot of announcements. Uh, demonstration gardens are you know, back in, in full swing. I think Deanna Rose is the last and they're going back to work next week. Uh, Wasmer Parks had three great days. I think West Flanders is doing their first planting if all goes right tomorrow morning. And uh, Hotline's back uh, on a limited cruise um, session. And so we're, we're slowly trying to get uh, our new normal in place. So. If there's no other questions, I will stop the recording and thank you guys all for uh, logging on today and we will have another training in a, in a couple of weeks. Okay, bye guys. Thanks, Dennis. Bye, thank you, Dennis. Bye, good session. Thank you.